Hello, I'm Dave Ortega from Somerville Media Center, and I'm happy to be back in the hot set here at 90 Union Square, um, talking with uh, some, some movers and shakers here in Somerville to give us the update, the latest on the business perspective during this business interruption due to COVID-19. So with me, I'm, I'm joined once again with Jessica Ashleman, who's the Executive Director of Union Square Main Streets. Hello, Jessica. Hello, Dave. Thank you so much for continuing this conversation with us. Uh, it's really always a joy to be talking with you and lovely to be seeing you in Union Square again. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> and I'm also joined with Jen Atwood, who is the executive director of East Somerville Main Streets. Hello, Jen. Hi, thank you for having me. Of thank course. you for putting the calls together. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for joining. Uh, and then I'm also joined with Blake Evett, who is the director of Parkour Generations. Hello, Blake. Hey, Dave. It's great to be here. Thanks for joining us. And uh, Alan Chan, who is the manager of Lotus Express in East Somerville. How are you, Alan? I'm doing great. Thanks, uh, Dave, for putting this all together. Really appreciate it. All right. Yeah. And, and like I said at the beginning, the point of these conversations is to turn the focus on uh, businesses and business owners and uh, stakeholders uh, to be able to, to get their point of view out there because, you know, we're seeing a lot of, of things in the news, but, you know, what, what's missing some of the times is uh, the, the actual perspective from business owners themselves and what they're seeing and what they've been seeing since March, what they've seen through the summer and, and kind of like their perspective about, about what's going on. So to start this off, uh, Blake and Alan, uh, why don't you give us all each a, a snapshot of what your summer has been like for your business? All right, thanks. So business uh, has definitely been more difficult. Uh, a lot of our business was a catering business, a good portion of it, with a lot of uh, Boston still shut down and a lot of the uh, offices and the tech companies still shut down, then a large portion of our catering business has evaporated into thin air. Uh, with that being said, we are uh, super and very, very thankful for the uh, local community. And usually a restaurant business, uh, a lot of their uh, business comes within a three mile radius from the restaurant. So that would be the, the residents of Somerville, the residents of Cambridge, Medford, and they've been still super supportive and they still order takeout, they order delivery from us. So we're definitely able to navigate the situation at hand because we're primarily a delivery and takeout restaurant with only like 24 seats in the restaurant. So overall, we've been able to survive this particular situation and it, we're just thankful for the local residents and the local help from people like Jennifer, uh, just, just providing a lot of support. She sends a lot of emails out to us, letting us know um, about different government programs that are available to us. Uh, she's also assisting with making signage, where to get particular supplies. So we've definitely uh, received a lot of uh, support from the local community and it's uh, been a real blessing for us to just get through this situation. And she's particularly well because a lot of the uh, businesses in the area are immigrant run. So a lot of the emails they have, um, they're bilingual or they're in different languages so that some of these uh, immigrant run businesses can still get the help that they need to uh, navigate this particular situation. So we're just really thankful for everything that's been going on and uh, we'll definitely get through this. So just look forward to uh, serving the community as, as we've been doing for the last seven years. So that's kind of what. Yeah. So we actually got shut down, uh, or all of our classes kind of evaporated very early on. We actually were teaching in one of the first Boston schools that had a case come up. Um, and so we, we had about a three day heads up on the rest of Somerville, uh, about what was coming. And normally during the kind of spring season, we teach about 70 classes a week throughout greater Boston uh, in a lot of schools and community centers and fitness centers. Um, obviously all, all of those shut down. Um, and so we had a very hard pivot to online programming, which we've been running from basically mid-March. And our coaching team uh, has come together really well to kind of adapt to these new circumstances. Um, but obviously our, our summer schedule, which is usually, uh, we're running three to four to five programs 
uh, in the morning and, and same in the afternoon in different summer camps and, and cl sports clinics around the region. Um, those are not happening. Um, we have been able to, thanks to our connection with the rec and the kind of the um, setup that they put in place, we've been able to run um, some shorter uh, youth programming in the local parks over the summer. Um, so those have been going really well and we've seen really um, great support from our local families, especially in Somerville, Cambridge and Medford. Um, with people coming out, kids are stuck inside all day and they can't see their friends and they're bouncing off walls. So for us, it's a way to redirect some of that energy and uh, to keep our team employed um, and food on the table, um, but also to help try to help our community by, by providing an outlet um, and providing something positive in this um, time of uh, intense struggle for a lot of folks. Um, we are looking forward to the fall with a little bit of trepidation. I think a lot of our school contracts and, and plans have, have been very much changed. All of our big events um, from Carnival to Fluff Festival to Summer Streets, um, all of those events have been canceled for the year. So it's part of our, our big outreach. Um, but I think we're fortunate enough that we have a, a strong connection here in the city with a lot of um, local families and, and community partners. And so we've been able to, to maintain that and, and build that. Um, but I, I think definitely having the, the local support from the city to be able to run programs in the parks and, and open spaces has been, has been clutch. Um, ironically, that's where we started eight years ago with teaching, park, uh, teaching classes in the parks and we've never left that. Um, and this is where we are very appreciative of our, of our business model to, to be agile and flexible and adaptable. Um, and so we're just kind of embracing that. And are you looking to return to in-person classes at some point in the fall? Yeah, so, so we have started uh, all of our summer, um, the skills programs in the parks are in person. Um, and we are combining that with our online classes. So we've been running daily on cl online classes for youth, um, for folks that can't come out of the house or don't feel comfortable with that yet. We're also doing some limited in person stuff. And we are planning to run in person small group programming um, in the fall for especially given that a lot of the schools are not going to be meeting in person and there's going to be a lot of uh, kids that have pent up energy and are stuck on zoom calls for four to six hours a day and are not getting the physical education or kind of the exercise that they need um, through zoom. Um, and so we're going to be providing resources to that. We've been fortunate to work with um, the Somerville out of school time network and the Somerville education foundation um, who have put together a summer camp program led by a, uh, Heather, who is out of SMC, and she's been doing a great job. Um, and we're trying to see if there's a way to continue that through the fall to be able to build that program out and provide resources, because there is a huge imbalance in, in access to services. There are a lot of kids that can afford to have the tutoring and the extracurricular activities that, that come with kind of access to resources, and there are a lot of kids that get left out. And so one of the goals with, with summer camp is to make sure that everybody has has access to, to high quality programming. That's great. And there's, there's a lot to navigate here for businesses, um, you know, with, with, from, you know, since mid March, you know, with social distancing and uh, the information coming out of the CDC and from the state, as well as the, the, the city. Um, so, so how do you navigate that? Um, you know, what, what resources uh, are you looking to? And this might be a good opportunity for, for Jessica and Jen to also uh, come in on this question uh, about the information that, that they provide uh, as well to businesses. Um, so, uh, Alan, which, which resources um, and guidance uh, are you looking to? So uh, Jen has been particularly helpful in providing a lot of information from the city on the guidances that are necessary to reopen restaurants. Uh, for example, face masks, everyone has to wear them entering into the restaurant. And uh, briefly, or what was recently rolled out was uh, in, in person dining and there's specific guidelines to that and uh, specific social distancing rules. So. Uh, Jen was uh, pivotal in helping out a lot of the local restaurants in terms of bringing on, I think, an architectural team that would help because you have to redesign the whole layout of the restaurant. 
and to, to accommodate for social distancing. And a lot of these immigrant restaurants have no idea what's going on. So uh, to have Jen uh, accommodate and help in that situation was extremely helpful, especially because they want, the city wants like a literal floor plan, like drawn out. And it can't be like drawn out by hand. It has to be computerized and drawn out. So you can imagine a lot of, you know, these these uh, immigrant business owners being like, what the heck is going on? And right. having just like no clue on how to do that. So Jen was really pivotal to helping get the paperwork together and, uh, you know, helping assist to file that with the city so that people were in place to uh, accommodate the new rules and regulations that were in place so that we could move forward in, in opening the dining rooms up. And even though we have limited seating or, or having outdoor seating, it's definitely a uh, bridge and a gap to having people come back to some form of uh, normalcy, you know, because just being locked in the house all day is definitely driving crazy. So being able to go out and eat something at a restaurant just lets you breathe a little bit, especially since the weather's been very nice in the summertime. Then just going out, eating outdoors has definitely been been nice. So uh, the whole community has just been really, really helpful. And like I said, we're just super thankful. And, it, you know, there's always more information coming out from the CDC. And as long as you stay on top of it, then, you know, Massachusetts is doing pretty well based on a lot of the regulations that were put in place. And yeah, we, we're just thankful to be in this area and people, you know, want to follow the rules so that we can all get through this together and get through this together quickly. And as you can see, Massachusetts has done pretty well for one of the states being closest to one of the epicenters in New York. We've navigated the situation pretty well. So, yeah. you know, and that's, you have to attribute that to, you know, to people on top uh, putting together good programs so that we can navigate through this situation effectively. And yeah, it, it might be a little bit slower, but, you know, you know, everything seems to be moving along in the right direction. So, you know, we're just thankful for the resources available to make that happen at this point. So, Jen, Alan brings up a, an interesting uh, uh, point about immigrant run businesses and uh, the sometimes technological barriers that are that are there for them, such as in the, in the instance that he, he brings up that the the uh, floor plans needed to be um, done on a computer. Um, so can you, can you elaborate on, on how you. Yeah. That yeah. So um, they, the city was fairly flexible in allowing um, the new plans to be drawn by hand, but um, you still need to like either take a picture or scan it in. Um, they still needed to be to scale, which I think a lot of um, the city kind of, uh, doesn't realize how difficult that can be for um, some of these business owners that haven't had to do that themselves before. Um, so thankfully, we had some really fantastic volunteers, um, including Cindy Larson of Centerpoint Architects, who's on our board, um, who uh, volunteered their time. And for a week and a half or so, we just went one by one and we measured inside and outside um, pretty much, uh, we didn't get, we didn't do Alan cause I think you were all set, especially cause your business is particularly focused on less on the indoor and outdoor dining, but everyone that we knew that needed it, we just kind of, we just spent a week measuring. Um, and I think that helped, uh, move that progress on a little bit as quickly as possible to get those businesses able to open those types of dining, which was, which was fantastic. Um, do you say that like, with Lotus Express, they're a really great example of doing everything right in terms of safety standards. So um, one thing that I was really impressed with when I, when the businesses were having to shift and pivot was the fact that they had built like the first plexiglass barrier that I saw, not just in like Somerville, but in like any restaurant in the area. So they were on top of it and they, um, I think that I can't give enough like credit to the work that Alan has done to make sure that people feel safe going, going and eating and ordering from Lotus. So 
Um, so kudos <laughs> Alan, for doing that work. It was, it was great to take that. And also um, it, it gave the idea of us to raise money for PPE for the businesses. So that was another thing that we did um, was we did porch portraits, which was like a fun community project, but we used the funds to buy care packages for the businesses, um, which has been helpful for some of them, including like Gautrao, um, Brazilian cuisine, for example, if people come not wearing masks and they're required to wear masks to patronize the business, they'll provide one for free. Um, and so that helps um, hopefully keeping business going through all the closures that are that are happening. And um, I, you know, half the time I copy Jess's emails as well, because um, I know that she and Union Square uh, have also, we're trying to share as much information um, to the business. That's like key in all of this and making sure all the businesses know what's required and also what financial and legal resources are out there and are available. So Jess and I um, are pretty good about sharing those resources with each other and other partners and anyone that could use that information. Um, so that's been, I think, really key and important to to helping as much as we can. Um, yeah, it's 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 been great to have have the local resources. Um, we actually have, have been doing a lot of national research as well because we have other branches in other parts of the country that I run as well. Um, and I'm also involved on a on a national on the national governing body for parkour, and so putting together resources for that. Um, we have pulled on stuff that we've been sent from from Union Square, Main Streets. Um, I'm on a lot of the newsletters for Somerville and Cambridge, and so kind of pulling from a little bit of everywhere, but I think go pay, being also a, a resident of, of Union Square and being able to go to the businesses and see what people are doing is, has been really helpful as well and, and see what measures people are taking uh, for their own businesses. It is a little bit different because not many of the other fitness facilities, um, if any, are open because they're not used to coaching online or outdoor classes like we are. Um, and, and they don't already have that relationship with a rec, which was really pivotal for us. Um, but being able to adapt that to that quickly was, was pretty important. Um, and now I think Union Square Main Street has been doing a great job of advocating for the businesses that are, are still shut down um, and not able to open. Cause I think that's, that's the next stage is, is there's a lot of businesses that aren't able to, to open at uh, full capacity, obviously, but also in any capacity which can be really tough. I know we have relationships with, with Brooklyn Boulders and the Central Armory and, and both of those key partnerships have, have not been able to, to open and, and we're obviously not allowed to, to have programming there because of public safety. Um, but I think long-term, that's something that we're going to have to address. Yeah, Jessica, um, can can you expand a little more on, on some of the advocacy that, that uh, Blake alluded to? Um, the, the, the advocacy that, that you're um, initiating and, and uh, as it pertains to businesses that, you know, have partial uh, availability to open or just don't have the ability right now to open. Absolutely. Um, in terms of sometimes it's a, a matter of selecting which direction to move in because it feels like there's so many important directions that we could be moving in at one time. So one thing Union Square Main Streets really tries to do is hear from our businesses directly what would be most meaningful. And so the there's really two or three primary channels that we use to collect that information that helps us understand how to prioritize that advocacy. Um, one is we did a district impact survey right out of the gate when COVID business interruption happened to understand where the concerns were with the businesses. And we understood that rent was among the very top of those concerns. Additionally, we host monthly meetings um, that where we convene uh, businesses of Union Square. Typically, we had been doing that in a different Union Square business. In fact, we hosted one at Somerville Media Center last fall. Um, obviously, we needed to change that to a virtual formatting beginning in uh, March, in fact. And one thing that I'll, I'm, I'm, that I'll report and share with you all is, all the viewers, that is, is that our attendance in those meetings have actually increased, that we've moved to a virtual setting, which has given us uh, more voices to hear from, uh, more business types to hear from. What we're hearing from on this very call is Al has specific concerns related to food service, where Blake's concerns are of an entire different variety. So an organization like ours, like Main Street Program, 
needs to understand the spectrum of concerns across all those business types, including professional services and retail. So those monthly business meetings are, are pretty important for us to collect the concerns and to understand to the best of our ability how to prioritize addressing them. Um, and then finally, um, the tried and true method of feet to the street, as Blake said, popping in and out of businesses and talking with folks. How's it going for you? You know, what are you more comfortable sharing with me, not on a Zoom call with everyone else, perhaps um, attending? These are personal business decisions and concerns, opportunities and fears. So from that, we've heard we've been working um, following East Summer Bell Main Street's leadership on rent negotiations with landlords. Uh, employee testing is another area where we uh, really believe it would be meaningful to, um, to really help build consumer confidence because I know that one of the greatest challenges for our businesses, if it's not rent, it's consumer confidence. You know, I'm open, I have all my safety protocols in place, yet my customers aren't coming at the volume that I was hoping that they were going to come. And so we know that there's a bridge to gap there. Um, so in response to that, uh, we took a form of advocacy where we're building a public campaign called the Union Square Diner, Shopper, and Customer Pact, where the idea is, uh, this will be messaging through the district, where it encourages everybody to take a shared responsibility of creating a safe business environment. Uh, Al and Blake are telling you about all the steps that they have taken to make sure that you are safe when you are um, engaging with their businesses, but biz but customers also have to come to the table safe as well, right? You know, we need to wear our masks when we're in there. We need to understand that service might be slower, uh, for example, at a restaurant because there's more steps in place to keep everybody safe. So we're working on a campaign to really create a community conversation about this idea of it's um, safety is a social compact and everybody has a responsibility and our business doing an outstanding job um, responding to evolving protocols and mandates from the city, but us as consumers also need to um, play our part. And then just to wrap this up, where we're looking at our advocacy next are, are in two particular areas. One of them is we're hearing a lot from restaurants. Al, I hear you said that you don't have that your emphasis is on um, delivery and takeout and catering when that comes back into the mix. So I don't know if you're doing a patio, but we're hearing a lot from businesses. It's, it's not, um, it's expensive to set up an outdoor dining setting. And if I can only do this till the end, till November, is the ROI worth it? Am I going to have enough revenue in order to make the expenditures and the extra protocols necessary? So we're advocating, um, to the city that those permits be extended at least through December 31st and preferably through calendar year 2021. And that is so that as businesses think about taking on heaters, for example, to keep people warm through the holiday season outdoors, it doesn't make sense if you can only use it this particular season. But if we can tell our businesses you, you can use it for another entire year, as New York City announced that they are doing as of Monday, so we're seeing this leadership elsewhere, that would be very meaningful for our businesses. And then lastly, um, there's not yet uh, any, any entertainment allowed outdoors on the patios. And in Somerville, the creative economy and the spirit of uh, arts of all form is so central to who we are. Um, that that's a conversation that we're starting to have with more groups, such as the chamber, for example. Um, can we be working together to perhaps uh, look at some modified regulations where we can bring some of the spirit to our Somerville businesses back to them in very safe and COVID prepared ways? So we're coming out of our COVID summer into COVID autumn. Um, and so what are what are the hopes for uh, for the autumn? Uh, for each of your businesses, uh, and I'll start with Alan. Uh, we just from from what I've been hearing, because a lot of uh, my customers they work with a lot of or they're at some of these large corporations that have so a lot of this unfortunately is still going fortunately or unfortunately is still going to be pushed back into 2021. So I'm fully expecting um, not to have a large portion of my catering business come back. Uh, with that being said. Uh, we're just going to do the best that we can. And, you know, we're just happy to be here to serve the community. And I'm sure everyone's tired of cooking at home. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we're here to provide takeout and delivery to people. Um, we just look forward to 
you know, just stay positive because, you know, in, in a negative environment, you always just want to be as positive as, as possible because, you know, as we take steps forward, everyone's, you know, working together as a community. And I guarantee you, we're going to get through this and we're going to come out uh, stronger than ever. So I just feel that, um, you know, even with the parkour and like they have, you know, people outside can exercise and I'm sure things will get stronger and stronger and better and better. And it's all coming along. And uh, we, we just have to look forward and have hope for the future. So that's kind of my attitude towards things. And, you know, in, in the darkest of hours, the, when the light comes in, it'll shine the brightest. So that's kind of what I'm looking forward to. Uh, I think like, like Alan said, we're, we're definitely looking forward to, to having people come out and, and kind of reemerge after um, sheltering at home for long periods of time. And I, I'm hoping that now that we are kind of acquainted with, with how this, this works and how to wear masks and how to behave in public and, and how to kind of uh, be a good citizen, that we can go back to a lot of the things where we're kind of getting takeout and participating in fitness activities and not just kind of staying inside our own very small bubbles at home, but like expanding those bubbles to, to responsible um, sizes. Um, and, and we're already adapting to, to plan for the fall to offer kind of pod classes and homeschool classes and online sessions to, to be able to accommodate the kind of diverse nature of, of people's needs in, in this new topsy turvy economy. Um, and, I think having the uh, so many of the school districts that are still deciding how things are going to work out and, and who's going to be at home and who's not going to be at home and who's going to be remote and who's going to be with the kids. Um, I think we're just trying to, to serve as many members of the community as possible and, and to be able to offer services um, and not have to worry about paying our, our employees. We, we got PPP funding this past spring, which kind of helped us put away some uh, kind of to obviously feed our instructors, but also not to drain our reserves. Um, and so we've been able to offer um, scholarships to all of our programs, full scholarships, to all of our programs for anybody that needs it um, to any kids that are on free and reduced lunch can participate for free. All of our online classes have a free option because um, we realize that a lot of families are hurting right now and, and exercise is an important piece of, of health, just like nutrition. And so if we, if we're working with our, our local restaurants and they're providing the nutritional side of things and we can kind of keep people fit and insane, um, that's our, that's our duty. Yeah. Well, I think, um, I mean, Jess will probably say that we're probably both hoping that we'll see a second stimulus package come from the federal government. So that's like top of my mind, um, knowing how essential those, um, PPP loans have helped keep our businesses going um, through this. So still holding out hope um, that we'll see that come. Uh, but in terms of our programming, we have a new program. Uh, we can't do foodie crawl this year, which is unfortunate. But um, instead, what we've decided to do is focus more on driving business for the, the local economy. So we have this new Meal of Fortune uh, program, which is a surprise meal. You order a ticket and we will match you with a restaurant in East Somerville based on your specific, unique flavor profile. Um, and so the fun is you don't know what you're going to get, but you're definitely going to get something amazing from a local East Somerville restaurant. So I encourage, um, it will be the week of September 28th through October 4th. You can have breakfast, lunch, dinner, you can order as many surprise meals as you want, but, um, it should be a fun, exciting program that will go back, um, hundred percent of the revenue is going to the businesses. So, um, we're looking forward to that. Uh, instead of doing our annual Halloween block, uh, party. We're also going to be offering Halloween porch portraits as well um, for, for our volunteer photographers. We'll be out taking photos of the community members in their costumes. So you can sign up for those as well. And uh, we have to ha are still doing the pickup market um, at least through August, possibly extending a couple weeks into September. So that's still running and it's um, a great way to support entrepreneur businesses during this crisis. So those are our three programs that I'm going to plug right now. <laughs> great. Yes, Jessica. Jen, I love the meal of fortune. This is so fun. Can people gift that? Like yeah. if you loved your parkour instructor and they did a great job and the family wanted to express appreciation, could they send like Blake a surprise dessert or something like that? 
Yeah, they could totally do that. <laughs> there's, so um, much- <laughs> there's scales on 25, 50, and 100. Um, so you basically, you can pick and choose what day of the week, what time, um, and then what level of price point you want, uh, depending on the number of people you plan to feed. And so you can send it to someone, you could buy it for yourself. Um, it should be just a fun way. Instead of restaurant week, it's um, a fun way to uh, maybe try something you haven't tried before. I feel like I always order the same thing every time because I know I love it, but there's so many great options. And um, especially considering we have such international cuisine available in East Somerville that people may have been a little maybe um, fearful of trying something different, like try Salvadorian, try Ethiopian for the first time. And this will hopefully like maybe push people over the edge to try something new. So we're excited. Yeah, just by by being daring and ordering a mystery meal. <laughs> that sounds great. I love that idea. Uh, and Jessica, what what do you have up for the fall? I know I know you have something big. <laughs> oh, I think you might be muted, Jessica. Thank you. There you are. As I mentioned, on the advocacy front, really keeping the rent relief conversation front and center. This is the elephant in the room. There's an eviction moratorium that's keeping everybody in their structures, I'll just say, both houses and commercial spaces. But we have to keep this alive and going. Um, When that lifts, we will have a totally different community if we do not have supports in place. So like Jen said, keeping an eye on a stimulus bill from the feds, but also what can be done at the state and the local level, expanding those patios and bringing the arts back into our world, uh, into our community to the extent possible. In terms of events, uh, Farmer's Market every Saturday uh, from 9 to 1 at Union Square Plaza, right behind where Dave is standing right now. It is a COVID-prepared market. We have a SNAP match, so anybody who um, is receiving SNAP benefits, they can get uh, them doubled up to $10 currently, and we think that we're looking ahead to increasing that match thanks to some generous funding that is on its way to us, so stay tuned for that announcement. And then the final thing that I'd like to share, which I'm very excited uh, to share with the world, because uh, this year we have an opportunity to strut our worldwide fluff pride. Um, As your viewers may know, Union Square Main Streets, in collaboration with the Somerville Arts Council, produces the Fluff Festival. We've done it every year since 2005 in the heart of Union Square with 20,000 people typically. So it's not happening like it usually does. Instead, on September 12th, um, in the evening, we will be presenting a virtual festival, the first ever virtual festival. The theme is In Fluff We Trust, Sticking Together Through Fluff. And I'm really excited uh, for everybody to be seeing the materials that are on their way out soon. It, this is as much about this is um, about as much celebrating local businesses as possible. So, Blake, I hate to put you on the spot, but can you you share a little bit with what you guys are cooking up for for this year's virtual fluff festival? Uh, yep, our team is actually hard at work dreaming up all sorts of physical challenges that you can do with fluff. Um, so parkour and movement related um, things that you can do at home and film them and join in the fun. And so that will be added to things. Uh, we'll, we'll have a few performances and those will be inside Union Square venues. We'll be pushing takeout as much as possible. We've moved it from three to seven to the evening for that purpose. There'll be a highly curated fluff stuff vendor um, area. We're taking the cooking contest and reinventing it, Fear Factor and reinventing it. Um, And really just celebrating the spirit of community and sticking together as Al, you were so inspiringly saying um, with your last remarks that we have to stay together as a community. Fluff has been central to Somerville's identity for many years. Um, We all know that the mayor included it in Amazon's uh, bid, so to speak. So we're excited to be innovative ourselves, retooling this. um, And we hope everybody will join us from wherever you are, whether that's Union Square or maybe you lived here and you move to some place like New York City, um, for example. You, there's no reason why you can't attend Fluff Fest this year. Excellent. Uh, that's that's the perfect way to wrap this up. I think uh, just 
I, I, I was feeling one way starting this, feeling good. I feel much better after, after this program, <laughs> like just the sense of community that you all uh, inspire and just, just hearing how uh, communities and community organizations and, uh, you know, are just adapting to this uh, in really, really positive ways. So thank you for joining me, Blake Abbott, Director of Parkour Generations. Uh, thank you for joining me, Alan Chan, the manager of Lotus Express. Jen Atwood, who is the director of Union Square Main Streets, ah, East Somerville Main Streets. <laughs> Jessica is the director of Union Square Main Streets. I'll fix that in post. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.